Welcome everyone to section number seven. This is surface integrals. In this video, we're gonna go ahead and calculate surface integrals of scalar functions uh, when our surface is given to us either explicitly or parametrically. And so, I mean, primarily we're gonna be doing the definitions and then we'll do one example here. Okay, and so the claim is, right, in 16.2, we upgraded, right? We upgraded from arc length to finding line integrals. And this is gonna be a very similar upgrade, right? Uh, so I guess, first of all, before I get ahead of myself, right, this ds value that we came up with in 16.2, this was the square root of our dx dt squared, so the derivative of our x component of our parametrization, then the derivative of our y component of our parametrization, plus 1 dt. Right? And then if this was in space, then we also had a, a z component, right? And so we took the derivative of that and squared it as well. And so now I'd like to upgrade from surface area to a surface integral. And it'll depend if our surface is given to us explicitly or parametrically. So I'm going to be defining this ds, right, with a capital S here uh, for the surface. And this is either going to be the square root of the partial of g with respect to x, squared plus the partial of g with respect to y squared plus one all under our square root and then this will be dy dx and that's where g right g is this equation that our surface is given explicitly by so that is if we have z equals some function of x's and y's we can use this however if our surface is given to us parametrically Right, so we have some nice parametrized surface with uh, parameters s and t. Then ds is going to be equal to the magnitude of r sub s cross r sub t, and then this is going to be ds dt. And these should look very, very familiar, right? These are exactly what we integrated uh, back in the previous section, 16.6, in order to get out surface area. Okay, and a nice little bonus exercise, right, is actually showing that these two definitions are consistent with one another, right? So if you were to go ahead and take an explicitly given surface and parametrize it, right? So take our explicitly given surface, parametrize it, where x is equal to s, y is equal to t, and then z is a function now of s's and t's, right? When you do that and you calculate out this magnitude of the cross product, you actually get the same thing. And so these are consistent definitions, right? They're not kind of one or the other. Actually, they do kind of reside together. And again, really, this magnitude of the cross product, that's where this explicitly given equation comes from. It's just this is kind of the simplified down version already. Okay, and so if we go ahead and use that uh, as our ds's, right, uh, we can go ahead and give surface area to be expressed as the integral over our surface of 1 d s and that's a capital s here and so just like area was the integral of 1 d a right so that's kind of in the x y plane and then we talked about volume was the triple integral of 1 d v we talked about how arc length was the integral of 1 d s right and now we have that surface area again kind of this fundamental quantity here lengths areas volumes right they are integrals of 1 with respect to the correct differential, in this case, ds. Okay, so I have an example coming up, but before we get to that, let me kind of formalize this stuff a little bit. Right, so now that we have this notion of surface area, let's do a surface integral. So we can have a surface integral of our function f over the surface s, and this is going to be given by the integral over the surface of f, and f can depend on x's, y's, z's, ds, and that's the capital S. And this can be expressed in two different ways, and it depends on if your surface right, is given explicitly or parametrically. So in the first case, if it's given explicitly, right, this is going to be equivalent. Let me just go ahead and shorthand this. I'm just going to go ahead and write f here. This is going to be equal to the integral over s of f of x, y, and if our surface is given to us explicitly, right, this is in the terms of like z equals a function g of x, y, 
So I would go ahead and I would plug in, right, everywhere I see a Z, I would go ahead and plug in this G of X, Y, whatever that surface is in this case. So instead of doing X, Y, Z, I'm going to do X, Y, G of X, Y, because that's Z in this case. And then we're going to have the square root of the partial of G with respect to X squared, the partial of G with respect to Y squared plus 1. And then this is going to be dy dx. So this is me just substituting in the ds, right, for uh, the explicit version of that. And now you'll see that there are no more z's in this, right? That's all y's and x's, and that's good because we're going to be integrating with respect to y and x. So that's why it's kind of important to get rid of this z. Okay, on the other hand, if our surface is given to us parametrically, then the surface integral is going to be equal to this integral over our surface of f, and now this is going to be parametrized, right? So, so we're going to have an x component, we're going to have a y component, we're going to have a z component. So we're going to plug in those parametrizations for the x, for the y, for the z, in for those values. So in this case, I'm just going to denote this with r of s t. So kind of, and we take the right components and we plug them in here. So again, our surface is given to us parametrically, so it's by some r, which depends on parameters s and t. Okay, so now let's go ahead and replace this ds. So this ds is going to be the magnitude of the partial derivative of r with respect to s cross the partial derivative of r with respect to t ds dt. And so when we actually go to evaluate things, right, these are the ones that we're going to be using. We're going to be using either this equation or this equation to actually evaluate out surface integrals. So those are going to be the useful things right there. All right, so let's go ahead and get to our example problem. Now, if you read the uh, subsection header, right, uh, I've had enough of these snakes on this plane, videos before class, so let's go ahead and read the example, right? Consider the entire plane, which I have loaded with snakes, according to the snake density function. How many snakes are on the plane? So this question gets solved with a surface integral, right, because we're over some surface, right? We're on this plane right here, and we want to add up something, right? In this case, I want to add up snakes, right? Snakes that are in different parts of this plane, so I'm going to go ahead and be adding up this nice snake density function, and that's why we're going to be using the surface integral, again, because we're adding up stuff on some surface. Well, this sometimes gets confusing, right? Because we have now two equations and we really have to distinguish which one is the surface versus which one are we integrating. So in this case, right, the surface is the plane. So this is our surface. And is it given to us explicitly or parametrically? And the claim is right now it's not given to us in either or, right? But we can go ahead and solve and get it in maybe an explicit equation a lot easier than maybe uh, parametrizing this. So I'm going to go ahead and make z equal to 4 minus 2x minus y. And now our surface is given to us explicitly. So z is some function of x's and y's. So in this case, we're going to be integrating our n, right? So this is our snake density function on the surface, right, z equals 4 minus 2x minus y. So there we go. And this is going to be equal to, and now we're going to go ahead and start plugging some things in. So this is going to be the double integral over s. This is 50 over pi root 6 e to the negative x squared minus y squared. And now, because our surface is given to us explicitly, I'm going to be using this one up here. Right? So first of all, anywhere that there were z's, I would go ahead and plug in 4 minus 2x minus y, but in this case, there were no z's. Next up, I want to go ahead, instead of writing this ds quantity, I'm going to go ahead and evaluate this. So this is going to be the square root of, if I take the partial with respect to x, I'm going to get negative 2, square that, plus the partial with respect to y, that's going to be negative 1, square that, plus 1. So again, I'm just following this formula up here for my ds. And then this is going to be dy dx. So in this case, we can see that this is actually going to be the same thing as root 6, right? Negative 2 squared will be 4. Negative 1 squared will be 1, plus 1, 
right? So this is going to be root 6. So that's going to perfectly cancel out with the root 6 down here. So we're going to have the surface integral of 50 over pi times e to the negative x squared minus y squared dy dx. And if you sit and you think, how do I integrate this? Well, it turns out we've actually seen this integral before, and it was kind of maybe the inspiration behind polar coordinates, that this right here is a very difficult thing to integrate. And so I'm going to go ahead and put this into polar coordinates instead. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is going to be 50 over pi, and then this is going to be e to the negative r squared, and then I'm going to have r dr d theta. And now at this point, right, we should probably start thinking about our bounds of integration, right? So if I want to integrate over the entire plane, what should my radiuses range between? Well, I claim that they should range between 0 to infinity, right? You don't want to stop at any finite number, otherwise you wouldn't get the entire plane. And likewise, our thetas should range between 0 and 2 pi, because again, I want to get the entire plane. So this is interesting because it's actually an improper integral in this case, but we can evaluate it, right? We've had calc 2. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this as the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 d theta times the integral from 0 to infinity of, let's see, 50 r e to the negative r squared dr, right? So I'm going to go ahead and rip this up because this is a function of solely thetas and a function of solely r's, right, in these limits of integration. They don't depend on either r or theta, so we can go ahead and split these up into two single integrals. This allows me to evaluate our theta integral very quickly, right? This is just going to be 2 pi, because I integrate, I'll get theta, evaluate it 2 pi and at 0, there we go. This other integral takes a second, however, right? So technically you would use a u substitution, probably where, let's see, u, that's a horrible u, u is equal to negative r squared, and then du would be equal to negative 2r dr. And so I would go ahead and write this as r dr is equal to du over negative 2, right? Because I see that I have an r and a dr right there. So I can go ahead and trade those in. And so when I integrate this carefully, oops, there we go. When I integrate this carefully, I'm going to get, let's see, negative 25 e to the negative r squared, and I need to evaluate that from 0 to infinity. And of course, you can go ahead and take the derivative of this. Double check. When I take the derivative, do I get back to where I started? Absolutely. And of course, if this went too fast for you, right, you can take it step by step, and you'll get the same answer here. Okay, now at this point, we need to go ahead and evaluate. Again, this is technically an improper integral. I'd like to kind of just, you know, ad hocly do this really quick. So if I plug in infinity, right, so we're going to have infinity squared, and we're going to have a negative sign. So this is going to be like negative infinity, and then I'm going to minus the negative 25 e to the negative 0 squared. So that's just going to be e to the 0. So let's go ahead and think about this. e to the negative infinity. Well, let's go ahead and look at our e graph really quick. So we have something like this. This is what e looks like. Right? And as you approach negative infinity, e is getting closer and closer to 0. So in this case, it's going to be 2 pi times, let's see, this is going to be negative 25 times 0, so that's just going to be 0, plus 25, and this is going to be e to the 0, that's 1. So in this case, we have 2 pi, and you know what? Uh, I forgot, right, this 50 over pi. I'm going to say, this isn't a whole number of snakes. I thought I did better with this. You're probably yelling at the screen this entire time. All right, so again, this 50 over pi, I just wrote down 50 here. All right, so let's go ahead and do 50 over pi. So this is going to be 25 over pi. Right? So again, these pi's right here, they cancel out. So I'm going to go ahead and just erase this, erase this. There we go. And so let's see, I'm going to get 2 times 25 equals 50 snakes. So again, the question was how many snakes were on the plane. In total, there were 50 snakes on the plane. All right, so that's it for this example and for this video. I'll see you guys later.